Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Robert Doerr, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm very glad to greet all of you here with us today and those of us who are viewing by live stream. Um, I don't come to all of the events we do at AI, but I try to come to the ones that are important, and this is an important one on a topic that is under covered and underappreciated for its significance in American public policy. Um, it's hosted by the great Mark Warshawski, who I think is one of uh, probably the leading expert on this topic, and that's something we like to have at AEI. Um, and it is entitled Modernizing Policy for Eligibility for Federal Disability Benefits. Um, I want to give you a sense of why I think it's particularly important. Um, I spent seven years as the Commissioner of Social Services in New York City, and prior to that, 11 years working in the social services departments of New York, Department of New York State in various capacities. And in those programs, in in, during that time, I oversaw the TANF program, the Medicaid eligibility program, the SNAP program, many programs that serve the lowest income, uh, most struggling uh, parts of our state. Uh, and then, as I, we tried to serve them in various ways, and we did our best, we weren't perfect, there was this other thing. And this other thing was the Social Security Disability Programs. Um, and I felt, as I observed people, similar populations, similar struggles, uh, similar income levels, that while we were doing some things in our programs that helped attach them to work and to substance, uh, substance abuse treatment programs, programs to help them get more healthy, uh, there was in this other world of steady, significant, important cash benefit but not a lot in the way of helping people move forward and into work and into a, 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 a more flourishing existence. And it troubled me. And I found since coming to AI that as we work on a variety of social services programs in the country, this area is still underappreciated and under, under attended to. And that's why I'm so proud that Mark is here with us at AI and that we're taking up that topic in a variety of ways. I don't know all the solutions. It's not all about work. It's not all about, get, about getting better. There are a lot of complexities to it. But there are too many people in these programs who are not, in my opinion, moving forward. I think they show up in our homeless population, and they show up in our population of people who are really struggling and not moving forward. And so it's an area that we're very proud at AI that we're working on, and we're very proud that Mark is doing this work. I also should say, as a sidelight on, on outstanding experts, it's also great that we also have Andrew Biggs as AEI scholar on Social Security retirement benefits. So think of that at AEI. We have both Andrew, Andrew and Mark. That's a pretty good uh, uh, duo on this important topic. Um, so just a little bit about Mark as I'm introducing him. He is the Searle Fellow and Senior Fellow at AEI. He has been a leading policymaker and scholar on issues of retirement, Social Security, and disability policy over the past two decades and in the last two Republican administrations. Dr. Warshawski joined AI in 2021 after concluding four years at the Social Security Administration as the Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy. He has served on the Social Security Advisory Board and is Vice Chairman of the Federal Commission on Long-Term Care. As Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy from 2004 to 2006, he played a key role in developing the pension Protection Act of 2006. Uh, Dr. Warshawski has also worked in the private sector, specializing in customized retirement income strategies. He has been a scholar of these issues at the Mercatus Center, the MIT Golub Center for Finance and Policy, and now, as I said, at AEI. And we are very glad that he's here, and I'm very proud to introduce him to our discussion this afternoon. Mark? Thank you, thank you, Robert, uh, for that very, very kind introduction. And uh, I also want to thank everyone for being here and online to uh, tuning in. And I particularly want to thank the panelists who have uh, joined us. Uh, you know, from from a wide perspectives, different different backgrounds, and and uh, so it's. I think it'll be a good good dialogue. All right. So I have some slides. And what, what I'm going to cover today is, is basically four topics. Uh, statistics uh, on SSDI and SSI uh, beneficiaries, which uh, 
you know, disability uh, is, is either through the DI program, which is part of Social Security per se, and an SSI, which is a, a welfare program. Uh, then I will, will give some statistics about what sort of work effort people who are disabled are, are doing and what, what uh, research says about that. Um, I'll also cover some other very recent research related to disability, both in the United States and on abroad. And then we'll, we'll t t uh, talk about our main topic, which is modernizing eligibility for disability benefits. So I will describe the need, the basically the, uh, the long, old, current standard, um, and the new data that is available on job requirements, uh, which can be used in a, in, a, in a reform, and then the policy update that is also needed. So that, that's what I'm gonna cover. Um, I, will, I will quickly go through some statistics. So this, this is a lot of numbers, but I'll just sort of highlight what I think are the most relevant. This is the number of beneficiaries uh, historically and projected. Um, and basically, um, there was a, 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 a height of 11 million beneficiaries under the disability insurance program around 2013, 2014. It is now currently about 9 million, um, and it is projected to increase to about 15 million. Um, uh, and and there's the point to make about the, de the recent decline, um, that that is a result of the, um, there were some scandals, really true, uh, problems with uh, administrative law judges. There were several judges that basically gave 99% approval rates, um, and there were there were, were bribes and, and other problems. And so SSA uh, instituted a review of ALJ decisions, and that did bring down the number of of, uh, of awards down. Um, but um, it is projected to, to increase, so it is a significant number of people, basically, you know, think about basically 9 million. Uh, SSA, uh, SSI, excuse me, is a, is a similar number. Um, it is about 6 to 7 million uh, beneficiaries. Um, this has also come down a little bit in the prime age work uh, group um, and is increasing for the elderly. Um, but, and, and there is some, some overlap. There are some people who get both SSDI and SSI. Um, but uh, if, you, if you sort of added it all together, there are about 14 to 15 million people who get disability benefits. So in terms of the uh, working, both the ch child age and working age, that is about 5% of the US population. So that just gives you some sense, you know, along with what Robert said, this is very significant. 5% of the US population uh, does get disability benefits. Um, here are some other statistics, um, just to give you some characteristics. Again, there's a lot of data. I'll just call out a, a few things. Um, when you look at the SSDI, which was the top top uh, uh, graphs, um, the thing that really comes out is that it's very old, an old group. Um, it is predominantly two thirds. It is age 50 and older. Um, so, and we'll discuss this more. This is significant from a policy point of view. It has the feel of an early retirement program. Whereas by contrast, SSI is much more diverse. It's more diverse in terms of age. Uh, it's a wider age group. It's very diverse racially. It's very diverse uh, educationally. In fact, it's, uh, there's generally a less, less educated group. And a lot of uh, people on SSI are alone. Uh, they've never married, whereas SSDI represents the work, working population, but the benefit, you know, the people who get the benefit are primarily older. Um, one other statistic, which is, I think, interesting and has changed over time, is the gender composition. So this is just DI, um, whereas it used to be that um, uh, DI was predominantly a male benefit. 
And you know, you have basically the, I would almost characterize as, as a stereotype of the factory worker who is injured on the job um, and he needs disability benefits. And so that usually, that hat historically was a male worker. Now it's pretty much a totally gender neutral program. Women are as likely to get benefits as men. Um, I mean, that's true in the retirement program, but it, what is interesting is it's also now true in the disability program. And I think that reflects the change in the nature of work, the nature of jobs, which we definitely will come back to. All right, that, that uh, concludes the first section, which just sort of gives you a, a very quick overview of the nature of the population that we're talking about. One, uh, one, the next thing is the sort of a notion of work. Um, because disability is given if you cannot work. Um, but nonetheless, there is residual capacity, work capacity, even among people getting disability benefits. So this is old data. I think SSA should update it. But, um, um, but it's interesting that certainly for DI and even on SSI, there are a significant number of people who, who do work. Now you have to work below a certain income level, otherwise you no longer get the benefit. And, then, and there are many people who work you know, up to the limit, so exactly you know, $2 less than what, what it is allowed. Um, but it, it, it is significant, it's about 12% uh, of the population. Um, there, is, there are some differences by age, uh, the younger you are, the more likely you are to work. Also, if you've just come on the rolls, you're more likely. But again, still, even among the older population and even people who have been on the rolls for a long time, there is clearly work, work capacity. And that's really, um, you know, we could go in through this data, and unfortunately it's old, but I think the, these points still, still uh, occur, are still valid. Uh, another... Um, a set of statistics, which again is, I think, important for the policy, is when you look at the type of work. Now, these are not only beneficiaries, these are all disabled uh, workers, uh, so people who are, do get benefits and people who did not apply for benefits. And if you look at them and you compare them to the workforce in general, what you see is that people who are, are disabled do need more flexibility. Um, and that's, they, they're more likely to work part-time, they're more likely to have temporary jobs, and they're also much more likely to work from home, which all makes sense. Um, and, and again, that's very important for policy because um, if, if the benefit is given according to the definition of what is required for work, and those definitions relate to a very rigid review, a very rigid view of what is required for work. In other words, you have to show up nine to five, five days a week, you have to go to the factory or the office, um, and, and if you don't, if you can't, you're eligible. Um, well, that's, that's a very rigid, unflexible view of what is required for work, for, particularly for people who are disabled. Um, and the question is, is that a realistic view of what is currently in, uh, uh, required for work, and that's why the data is so important. Uh, what do employers really require uh, for, for, uh, for, for work? And, and we need to be up to date with that because as we know, there's been a, a massive change with the pandemic in terms of what work requirements are in terms of the flexibility of schedules and so on. So um, you know, that's, that's why this, I think that data is important to know. And um, the other, other thing which is uh, quite interesting, almost a little surprising, is if you look at, this is BLS data, um, indicators of workforce activity for people with a disability, it has increased uh, very noticeably since about 2013. Uh, which is interestingly, and I don't know if there's cause and effect here, is the same time that the disability roles have started to decline. So you seem to see a relationship between declining disability roles and increase in work um, among people who do have disability. And, and it's really actually very stark uh, very recently in the last couple of years. Um, 
And so, and, and, and it continues, actually, it's, it's in the latest data. So I think that's also another indication of, of work capacity. So that, that uh, concludes the second section in terms of work capacity. Now I'm just very quickly gonna go over some very interesting, very recent uh, re research that has been done, three, three studies. Um, I'll go through this quickly. The first one uh, looked at the Great Recession years where you did ha see a big bump up in uh, applications and awards for disability. And these the researchers uh, found that, that the motivation was largely economic. In other words, that they did not apply based on medical factors, but they b applied based on vocational factors. And, um, and about 40% got awards. And they were mostly older workers, which, which um, again, related to the way the current policy works that uh, if you're older, you get a, have a much, much higher probability of getting on, on disability because you're assumed not be able to, to learn new skills or to transfer your skills from prior work. So um, that, that was a very significant increase in people on disability for economic reasons. And uh, you know, a, que a reasonable question is, was, were they well served by that because they obviously applied because they lo lost their jobs. Um, whether there should have been some other uh, re uh, reaction of government as opposed to using disability as uh, early retirement or unemployment insurance. Um, the next paper, which I think is, is very new in terms of current conditions, what they attributed this, what, what we saw in terms of the increase in, in employment among disabled uh, people is that a lot of them have, have migrated or are working in teleworkable occupations. And they define that, but it's basically a, a more flexible scheduling and, and, and work environment. And uh, again, uh, the claim I wanna make is that that needs to be reflected in, in a modernization. And then finally, uh, there, this is uh, for the Austrian uh, disability program. They uh, removed gradually the very generous eligibility standards for older workers, which is basically ages 50 to 7, 59. And this is a very well done study. It's a sort of a difference in difference study. What they found was that there was an almost a one for one in, uh, uh, relationship that um, uh, for those who are den now denied benefits because of the removal of the generous eligibility standards for older workers, um, they, they continued to work and there was no harm to their earnings or, or health. So, um, you know, I think that, that gives us some indication of what perhaps we could, we could see from a modernized program. So now let me uh, go to the, the, the main point of the presentation, which is the need for to modernize, modernize and then uh, how, how we could go about it. What data do we use? What policy should we use? So for disability benefits, this is a little wonky, but uh, you know, bear with me. Uh, there's a five-step uh, elig eligibility uh, criteria that is used by SSA. First is to see whether the person is eligible at all, that they've, they've worked in the past, and that they're now not working, that they have a disability of some significance and duration, so that's a sort of a, a first cut. And then uh, in step three, we, they evaluate, is there a, a severe medical problem? You know, for, uh, for stage four uh, pancreatic cancer. So if that's the case, you, it's, a, it's almost automatic that you will get disability. But that's not the majority of, of cases. The majority of cases is actually relate to can you work? So you move to step four and step five. Step four is can you do your past work? Um, and step five, um, can you do any other work that's available in the economy? And the way this is done is done by something called the grid. Uh, again, I'm not gonna, gonna uh, go through all the details. It's pretty complicated, but it, considering age, education, and experience, um, and evaluation of the applicant's residual functional capacity, there's a decision as to whether you're disabled or not. Now, the, the problem is that this grid 
and the whole regime that's around it was designed, uh, you know, almost 50 years ago. And it was a time, uh, you know, in the 70s uh, where you had an economy where labor was mostly physical. Uh, there were actually a lot of early retirements, uh, low education levels, very little flexibility. Uh, you know, you think of the punch, punch in for work and punch out and the whistle blowing and all that. Um, there was very low adaptability uh, assumed. That they assumed that people really could not learn, learn new work. Um, in terms of disability, there was very little, you know, available assistive technology, and uh, the, no one ever thought of working from home. So, um, and, and just the language is, is uh, almost quaint, uh, almost uh, uh, so out of date. So, for example, they use this, the language closely approaching advanced age. I don't know if, uh, if anyone wants to guess what, what age that is. You would, that sounds like 70, 75. Well, it's 50. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anyone who thinks of 50 as old age, but that, that is the way the regulation views it. And then 55 is actually advanced age. So, um, you know, this, this is uh, in, in way out of date. Um, the regulations were put in place in 78, and the data that is based on, which is called the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, was last updated in 91. The Department of Labor used to do it, and they've abandoned it many years ago. Now, there were past attempts to, to update it, um, very minor and very, um, not, 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 a, not a particularly um, ambitious update, and um, uh, it, 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 it went nowhere. So um, just among the reasons for, just to uh, continue along the same line, the reasons for change, just what has changed since 1978, there are in fact have been advances in technology and changes in the economy that have severely reduced the physical aspects of most jobs. Even the same job, let's say you work on a, a factory uh, assembly line, you know, it used to be very hard physical labor, but that is much less uh, the case, even for the same job, to say nothing of new jobs uh, that have been created since then. Um, we've discussed this, that work hours and conditions are much more flexible now um, than they used to be, um, and this was even before the Zoom revolution. Um, if you look at evidence with regard to mental and physical uh, capacity to work. I mean, now the view is that it, it's much more widespread, even at older ages. Um, and as uh, there have been, this is along the lines of improvements in health and functioning at, at every age within the population. And um, this is some very fine work by labor economists uh, that have shown that just overall in the U.S. economy, uh, routine manual tasks, in other production. As, as a share of the labor force have declined very dramatically, uh, whereas abstract, non-routine -routine, cognitive tasks have increased. So the mental aspect of work is much more significant. And this is also important in the data about job requirements because the, uh, the, the current data uh, doesn't have, says nothing about mental requirements for work. So SSA is sort of winging it, really, and they rely on vocational experts to make these judgments. There's no data in the current, current uh, setup, whereas in the new data, they've covered it, and we do have, now have data on mental requirements of work. Um, and then I've also mentioned that the labor force activity among the disabled has picked up. Now, uh, you know, in terms of the, the current system, um, I've mentioned this grid. It is made up of four charts, uh, one for each exertional limitation, which is, uh, in other words, sedentary, light, medium, and heavy work, and is plotted against age, education, and skill level. And, and according to this grid, you're disabled or you're not. Now, when this was designed in 78, um, it was intended to make the adjudication simpler because there, there are literally millions of claims every year. So um, it's, it's, you need some mass production and you need a simple process. Um, but uh, as time uh, um, progressed, there was less and less decisions made simply based on the grid. Uh, so now it's used directly only in about 10% of the step five cases. 
The, for the rest, it's used as a guide, and basically you need to bring in a vocational expert, and it's usually at the hearing with the administrative law judge. Um, and this takes time, so it's added to the, the, t the time it takes to make these judgments. And in particular, if there's a mental impairment or any non-exertional factor, you go off the grid, you go into this, what is called this framework, and then you have to bring in the vocational expert as to whether the occupational base that this whole system is based on has been eroded in the case of the worker, can they do the, the work? And it becomes a somewhat arbitrary judgment. Um, and, um, and also there, added to this is the notion that particularly for the older workers, there, they, we, they let, the policy, the regulation imposes limitations of assuming that they cannot adjust to new work. And, and age is very important in the, in the current rules. And it, it gives some very arbitrary uh, re results. So I'll just give two examples. Um, you could have a 32-year-old who does seem pretty disabled, a traumatic brain injury, but it is assumed that he can work. Whereas somebody who is 51 years old, um, who had no work background, and just has a muscular skeletal impairment, so you would think they could do some light or, um, or, or sedentary work, they are automatically found disabled. So it's, it comes out uh, pretty unfair. And another, you know, because you have these, these age uh, uh, um, rules, uh, between the difference between a 49-year-old and a 50-year-old, again, you get the exactly opposite result. And if you look at the data, there are very steep um, cliffs uh, in terms of uh, who gets benefits, and they're very big jumps at these ages. And, and if, you had, if you look at it and you do the research, if you remove those rule cliffs, it's a much more gradual increase with age. You certainly expect disability to increase with age, but it, does, it would not increase anywhere near the much, as much as it does at these uh, cliffs of age 50, 55, and 60. Now, again, the, it is important to that it's, the whole system is based on this old data. And we'll just give a couple examples of uh, really out-of-date out uh, jobs. So you have a phonograph cartridge assembler. Now, according to this SSA, this is a job that exists in significant numbers in the economy. I will make a bold claim and say that is wrong. There are probably 10. <laughs> and similarly, here's another one, the web press operator. Um, no way is this a significant number. But according to the SSA, it is. Um, and, uh, but by contrast, there are whole categories of jobs that don't exist. So the website designer, another web <laughs> um, job, it doesn't exist. And there are many others that just don't exist in the data. <clears throat> so clearly the program is ripe for, for, um, for reform, for modernization, and, and, we, and we, we can do it. There is new data. Um, this is collected by the BLS through paid for by SSA. Uh, after six years of preparation, testing, and surveying, uh, it's, an, it's a statistical sample of employers um, BLS has produced the first wave of occupational requirements. It's called ORS. Um, it classifies occupations according to the 1,000 SOX, which is the government standard for occupations. Um, these are quite broad, so there, clearly there are significant numbers here. There are often hundreds of thousands of workers in each job family. And uh, it describes what are the requirements of work in that occupations. And what's great about it is that you can match it with other data that the government collects. Uh, something called the ONET, which is our task for work, or uh, the EPP, the on-the-job training requirements, the OES, the number of workers. So it's a whole statistical system that the government has set up and that SSA has financed through the BLS for the uh, occupational requirements. Um, and then you can, you can you know, set up a system that 
uh, mixes and matches, or, you know, sorts and restricts by education, skill, strength, uh, work schedule, prior work experience, training requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Exertional elements, physical elements, sensory, environment, and so on and so forth. It's very detailed. Um, the, um, the, if there is any missing data, obviously any uh, interpretation would be in the claimant's favor. Um, the first wave did not include mental requirements of work, like memory and adapting, but the SSA did do a special study that uh, uh, basically supplemented the ORs for this uh, 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 issue, mental, mental requirements. In the current wave, uh, they are collecting mental requirements. Um, the first wave is done. It's been available for now five, almost four or five years. The second wave will be finished in 2024. Um, and it's cost a lot of money. Um, these are done by uh, uh, field economists at the BLS. It's, so far, it's cost SSA $290 million. It's cost about $42 million a year uh, to do the survey. Um, so if you use new data, obviously, you, you need to new, you put in place new policy. Um, and this is what I uh, have uh, put forward. And uh, it's not just I. This was a regulation that was imminent at Social Security in 2020 and, and, the, and January 2021. So the, the uh, idea was to make it simpler to uh, streamline the program um, and in using the new data. Um, we would only put people uh, back to work if we assume they could do entry-level work. So that simplifies the program a lot. It removes the whole need to do a transferability of skills analysis. Um, and similarly, we shortened for step four, the period of analysis to 10 years for 15 years that uh, seemed to us as sufficient um, uh, uh, background in terms of what, what person can do in terms of past work. We, we used the ORS data and other match data to do a more individualized uh, assessment given their residual functional capacity and we would just get rid of the grid uh, because it could be done all based on the data. Um, we, we made age much less important in the program. We basically have one age uh, uh, consideration, and that is at age 60, we would not put a person, assume that the person could do heavy labor. Um, that was consistent with the research, but everything else really, age 50, 55, were, were, there was no empirical support for, for such uh, age breaks. Um, we, uh, education was important. We wanted to change that in terms of also considering college education because that is more important now. And as I indicated, that we, we've significantly reduced the age-based uh, 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 assumptions of the old program. Um, age is relevant, but it's also only relevant in terms of the individual's uh, assessment. Um, and we don't want to double count age in the rules. So, um, and this whole process could be automated. Let me just give you a little sense of the data. This is on a macro level. Uh, again, you know, you can look at, at the BLS. It's all, all up on, online. Uh, what, what I find interesting is uh, a lot of work now in the economy really is sedentary and light work. Um, and what is interesting is a lot of work does not require higher education. There's either no minimum or just high school. And, you know, there's a variety of requirements in terms of verbal interactions, um, uh, being outside, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's on a macro basis. And just to give you one example of how it actually worked. So here's one job category. It's called library assistant. And it tells you what, what is requirement, required for work. Do you need to uh, work at a consistent pace? Uh, do you need to, how often do you need to verbally interact? Uh, and then what are the physical requirements of work, reaching overhead, lifting, carrying, and so on. So that gives you a, a, a sense of what this data does and how it would be used in the program. So let me conclude by saying that this modernization is way overdue. SSA worked on this regulation for the last 10 years uh, through 2021, um, uh, and, and an ANPM, and it was a preliminary regulation, was, was, uh, was issued. Um, there was an enormous amount of work done 
uh, and people who know who work with regulations know how much work is required. Uh, this was massive. I, I just just a ballpark figure. I, I say it cost the government hundred million dollars in terms of actual work uh, pay for the literally hundreds of people who are working on this. So add it all up. The, the government has spent about four hundred million dollars on this project, and so far there is nothing to show for it, which I think is is a shame because the program does need to be modernized. The taxpayer has paid for it and, and deserves a modern program. Our society deserves it. The beneficiaries deserve it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa Rhine. I cover the federal government for the Washington Post. And um, I, last year, um, took on the very complex task of writing about the Social Security Disability Program. So that's why I'm here today. And um, it's great that this panel um, is so represents a diversity of views on the ideological spectrum um, on disability policy, because um, it's really complicated and people have very, very different views about um, you know, what Social Security is doing and has not done and what would the outcomes be if um, the policy were to change, except I think everyone is in unison in believing that it really should change. Um, I'm going to just introduce folks um, from right to left. So uh, sitting next to Mark is uh, Rich Burkhauser. Um, and uh, Rich is a professor emeritus of, er, emeritus of policy analysis at Cornell University um, and NIBOR Research Associate, um, an IZA research fellow, and a visiting scholar here at AEI. And prior to his time at Cornell, he held tenured professor positions in the economics department um, at Vanderbilt and Syracuse universities. And um, between 2017 and 19, he was a member of President Trump's Council of Economic Advisors. Um, Rachel Gresler at Heritage is now at Heritage, the Heritage Foundation. She's a senior research fellow at the Grover M. Herman Center for the Federal Budget. And before joining Heritage in 2013, she was a senior economist on the staff of the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. And, and now at Heritage, Rachel Fotik focuses on retirement and labor policies, uh, which includes social security, disability insurance, pensions, and workers' compensation. Jack Smolligan uh, is at the Urban Institute. He's a senior policy fellow there in the Income and Benefits Policy Center. Uh, 
Before that, he was Deputy Associate Director at the Office of Management and Budget and as Director of the Education, Income, Maintenance, and Labor Division. Uh, um, Jack was responsible for oversight and analysis of programs at the Education Department, the Social Security Administration, the Low Income Assistance Program at Health and Human Services, um, and other agencies. And lastly, we have uh, David Weaver, who now is an instructor in statistics at the University of South Carolina. Um, before this, he spent um, four years at the Congressional Budget Office, where he led analysis of federal programs and policies that included Medicare, Medicaid, Affordable Care Act subsidies, and Social Security. Um, but perhaps most relevant to this conversation, David spent 24 years at the Social Security Administration, first as a research economist, then as Deputy Associate Commissioner for Retirement Policy. So uh, thanks to all of you. Um, and um, I think what would be great is if each of you could you know, take a couple of minutes, um, maybe starting with you, Rich, and then just going um, to Rachel, Jack, and David, and talk about your sort of, you know, reactions um, to what Mark has said, but, you know, your views on where disability policy is and should be, et cetera. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to make a, a, a product to what I do now. I have been emeritus at uh, Cornell for a couple of years, but I am, uh, once again, paying Social Security tax on my new job at the Civitas Institute at the University of Texas. Uh, a second uh, point is that uh, a lot of the debate about what's going on now, and as Mark pointed out, is the relative importance of age in decisions about uh, ability or disability uh, and uh, moving on to the roles or not. So in the interest of uh, uh, fairness, I'm gonna say that I am age 77 and I've never held the relative youth or the lack of experience of my colleagues against them. Ronald Reagan said that earlier. <laughs> yeah. For you youngsters. You can't get that joke. Uh, uh, what's going on here? What, what is this thing about age that makes it so controversial? Well, we have a social security system, an old age survivors insurance program, uh, that bases benefits for early retirement at age 62, and uh, normal retirement now at age 67. So why would you choose age as a criteria for eligibility? Uh, the answer is it's easily verifiable, and it makes the Social Security Administration able to provide benefits in a very clear way to both beneficiaries and to the taxpayer. Uh, disability is much more difficult to determine, as uh, a short uh, uh, explanation by Mark here uh, gets a flavor, but it's even more complicated than what he talked about. Uh, and because of that complication in determining eligibility, uh, the Social Security Administration, when it uh, first began in the 1930s, uh, did not have a disability program because uh, the senators and congressmen were old like I was now, they were that age, and they remembered, remembered the 1890s when paying disability benefits to Civil War veterans was the most expensive part of uh, the uh, federal budget. Uh, it was difficult to do it because it was difficult to distinguish age from impairment and disability. Uh, Mark uh, uh, really stressed how important uh, in the grid, uh, age currently is. And uh, if it's so important, why didn't Mark, I'm, I'm getting a major echo in, in here. You also, so I have to, I'm forced to listen to myself, which is really a bad thing. Uh, uh, Mark pointed out that under the current regs, age is a critical factor. Uh, why is that a critical factor? It's a critical factor because we now have a data set that allows us not to lean so heavily on age. Uh, so what is wonderful about the uh, Occupational Requirement Survey, although it's taken many years to finally get here, is that it offers us the opportunity now to get a thick set of data 
on the characteristics that are necessary to meet minimal uh, 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 functional requirements for uh, entry-level jobs. Uh, so we don't need age anymore as a proxy for what we don't know. But taking that to its conclusion uh, and believing that this data can now do that is a very politically fraught notion. Because what it says is that now, for those people over the age of 50, age can no longer be used as a vocational requirement. Now, in some sense, we should all be glad of that, because the alternative would have been for Mark to ask people, well, how, old, uh, how young do you have to be to have this job? But obviously, we've changed a lot since the 30s, and now age discrimination is inappropriate. So you don't want to ask questions of, of uh, employers about their age uh, requirements for the job. But in like matter, because we now have hard evidence or much harder evidence on the actual uh, functional relation, uh, relationships between uh, occupations and function, we don't need age as a stopgap. But some people are not going to be happy about that because we don't know what that will do to the overall roles. Mark thinks that it will probably uh, lower them because of the reasons that he talked about, that uh, uh, age is less important now. Uh, and so that when we remove age as an easier way to get onto the roles, that will reduce the number of people who are going to get benefits. And that's a controversial thing. Uh, what I'll tell you is it's important to do it because we have experience about uh, other countries and how they resolve their problems about growing disability roles. The number, the, uh, a key variable in uh, measuring the growth of the disability roles is the recipiency rate. That is the number of people of working age who are on the roles versus the overall uh, number of people on the roles. That's doubled uh, between 1990 and today. There was a concern about that, and Mark talked about some of the things in the last couple of years that the Social Security Administration did to try to handle the outliers on the, uh, on, in the fifth step uh, 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 judgments. Uh, this data has the possibility of, if it's in fact correct, of taking age out of the uh, measurements except in terms of step three with regard to the medical conditions and changing the outcomes. And that leads to uh, controversy. And that's at the heart of possibly why these regulations weren't passed in the uh, Trump administration, speculating that. I wasn't in the Trump administration at the time. Maybe I would have been able to do something, but I doubt it. Uh, uh, and it's why the Biden administration might be very reluctant to do it. So we may not see anything on this until after the next election. But despite that, we need to continue to push for this kind of uh, change. That's great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Rachel, your, your, your thoughts. Uh, I'm glad to be here today and to be talking about disability insurance. It's not something that has been a focus a lot in the last couple of years, but it is one of our unfunded entitlement programs. And unlike something like Social Security, where it's pretty much just structural issues, there's a math problem there, disability is broken in many ways, and it is not serving its intent. Um, it's really poor performing, and Mark has highlighted some of those things in large part because it is an outdated program. So I wanted to focus today on disability insurance within the context of the changing nature of work. Um, so for starters, disability is not uncommon. About 13% of Americans have a disability, but the types of disabilities are very diverse. So you have some people that have almost no functional capacity, and then you have some people that have very limited disabilities. Some people's disabilities are permanent. They're not going to change. Other people's could be temporary. Some people's are the same day to day, whereas others might wake up one day and feel OK, and another day be more impacted. Um, and yet we have a pretty much one size fits all disability insurance program. Um, over time, that percent of people with disabilities has not changed that much. It was 13% in 1980. It was 13% in 2020, but the percent of the people who are receiving disability insurance has more than doubled over that time frame. And that doesn't make sense when we look at the fact that healthcare has improved, there's more technological innovation, 
the type of work that people do is less physically demanding, and there are new work opportunities out there. So I want to talk about those new work opportunities, and especially within the last decade or so, when you look at what I'm going to call independent work. So that includes gig work, freelancing, independent contracting, temp work. It's a, a whole um, assortment of them. One out of three Americans did independent work in some capacity last year. That might have been a full-time job, or it might have just been a little side hustle. Um, the benefits of this is it's kind of the be-your-own-boss model. And so it's work that you can choose how much you do, when you do it. And as Mark was getting to here, when you look at the types of jobs that individuals with disabilities can do, it's things that are more part-time, that are flexible, and that can be done remotely. And so those types of jobs are the ones that are easiest um, for individuals with disabilities to do. I talked about that one in three. It's 59 million Americans that have done some independent work in the last year. 55% of them say that they did that because they cannot work for a traditional employer because of their own health, their family member's health, or their caregiving responsibilities. So that includes taking care of young children or maybe aging parents. So this is an opportunity that's out there that's increasingly available to more people, and I think that we need to make sure that that continues to be out there. Just two examples here. I have um, one of my friend's mothers was severely disabled. Can't get out of bed, can't feed herself, in a wheelchair, but she grades SAT papers. Um, another one was I was at home, I grew up in Western New York a couple years ago, and I see a headline in the Jamestown Post Journal that says, Uber's coming to Jamestown. And they were highlighting a young man with a disability that hadn't been able to work, but now that Uber was there, it was something that he could wake up and say, okay, I feel good today. I'm gonna get on the app and I'm gonna go drive and see how long I feel okay, and then I'm not going to on the days that I don't feel well. And so these opportunities are increasing, and I think that that is one positive thing we have going for us. But of course, the jobs that determine whether or not you're disabled, there's no mention of the internet anywhere on there. Um, so we definitely need a modernization there. And I think that the availability of these jobs and increasing capacity is not just a good thing because we want fewer people to be on the SSDI roles because it's expensive. Um, or it's certainly a good thing for people to be able to have more income but also what AEI has done great work on here is just the dignity of work um, and the meaning that comes from that. I don't think many people look towards a life on disability insurance benefits. It's isolating and I think that it is not fulfilling. And so in any way that we can help people to be able to work in some capacity, whatever works for them is a good thing. Um, so what are the things that need to be changed? Looking at the broken nature of the program, it takes far too long for people that need benefits to get them. More than half the people are having to appeal and the decision, and it ends up taking a year or more to get their benefits. And during that time, you don't have access to things like the health care that you need. And then on the other hand, far too many people are getting onto the program that were not intended to be receiving those benefits. Um, and then once you're on the program, there's nothing that helps you or encourages you to do work, at least not beyond um, the SGA level. And if anything, it's discouraging that because it was such a difficult process to get on that you don't want to risk potentially getting off and then having to go through that again. Um, so we need a better system that can assess people's capacities. So certainly updating using the ORs and the ONET. Um, and that would, I think, allow us to eliminate or at least substantially overhaul the grids. Age, education, and experience do not determine if you are disabled or not. It's your physical and mental capacity. And yes, there may be some links, but you don't need to take into account age and education experience if you're simply looking at the physical and mental capacity there. I think that we need to have a better system to accommodate for very diverse needs. One size doesn't fit all. And so policymakers should be looking at different structures, whether that's a tiered system um, that might allow more work for certain individuals or at the eligibility and the approval phase saying, this looks like something that's permanent that's never going to go away. This looks like something that could improve or this looks like something that is likely to improve. And maybe those likely to improve would have a reapplication process a couple years down the road instead of just receiving a, a postcard and just saying, check the box, still disabled, still disabled. 
Um, one more thing to actually help people to either not need to get onto the program or to get off it sooner is potentially allowing Medicare access earlier instead of having that two-year waiting period. Because if you've just experienced a disability, the first thing you need is health care and potential accommodations that could help you to regain some function. Um, the private disability insurance market does a far better job here at actually helping people. Of course, they have the incentive to do that. They don't want to be paying out the benefits. But when they step in, they're looking at what type of workplace accommodations can you have that will allow you to stay in your job. If you can't stay in that job, what type of job could you shift towards? And we will pay for the education to get you into that type of job. And we'll pay for childcare. There's just all these kind of wraparound supports in the private sector that are not there in the public sector. And so there could be some potential there for emerging at Heritage. I proposed having um, a payroll tax credit for employers who are offering the private disability insurance so they would pay a smaller portion of the disability insurance tax. But I think holistically, the DI program is not working well, regardless of the finances of it. Um, and we need to modernize it and help it to do a better job for people who need it um, and not to be using resources on those who don't. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Jack? Okay. Right. Um, thanks for the invitation to um, share in this discussion. It's really an important issue. And I think it's useful to put SSDI in a broader context of workforce services and supports and understand that when a worker gets a new potentially disabling condition, it's very important that we intervene early and provide supports to try to get that worker to stay attached to the workforce or to get back into a job. And ideally, um, we want to do that early enough that they still have an attachment to an employer. And um, that's especially important as workers age and are at greater risk of um, experiencing a disabling condition. Workers with a new condition um, may have rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act for a workplace accommodation with their current employer. And I think there's references to teleworking as one of those kind of examples of potential reasonable accommodation. Those are opportunities early on with the person who's adjusting to a new condition. And it's important to understand that fundamentally, SSA and the SSDI program is not the place to do that. SSDI provides a very important wage replacement insurance function for people who have tried to manage a new condition and have not been able to continue to do substantial gainful activity for extended periods. So it has an essential role there as a social kind of insurance program, but it's not the vehicle with which we can deal with the challenges of people that have new disabling conditions. And we've written a series of papers about where best we can do early intervention at Urban Institute and certainly invite, invite people to, to look at those. Um, so anyway, with that kind of broad context, and that's where I think I agree with the goals of many of the previous discussants, but have, have a very different notion about the strategy and how we implement that. And, um, but I'd like to transition to this issue around the Dictionary of Occupational Titles and this notion of replacing or eliminating the medical and vocational grid. And just, I think it's important to understand that we really have two separate issues there. SSA for years has been developing with BLS this new database, and David's going to discuss that aspect of it. I'd like to focus on the criticisms around the medical and vocational grids, because it's really important to understand that we have a, a very complicated technical process of replacing the DOT with BLS's new data, but then we also have a policy issue that's been interjected into that, I think ultimately merging those two in the regulation that Mark referred to as the proposed regulation, I think kind of made it very difficult to transition um, from one administration to another with, with, with a combination of a policy issue and a technical um, improvement in, in the program. And because I think that we do have a disagreement here on whether or not age and education should be important factors in um, determining eligibility when people um, experience a disabling condition. Uh, Rich, Rich Johnson at the Urban Institute has done a series of papers looking at older workers, and, and he'll track workers from like, 55 to 64 through various different surveys and sees a doubling of the risk of a serious disabling condition. And that's occurring in the, in the 50s, not just at, at age 60, as, as Mark references. So I think eliminating or reducing the importance of age 
it would, would be a mistake. Um, Jason Selgman um, looked at the health and retirement st study and found like three out of 10 early retirees were reporting involuntary retirement. And about half of that was because of a health condition. So these are people who were retiring when they didn't plan to because of a health condition. And that is fundamentally what SSDI is, is available for to protect those, those older workers. And so I think we do just have a difference on the policy. I think we all share a, a desire to abandon the DOT and to adopt the BLS data that SSA has been, been um, developing for, for many years and across many administrations. Um, Next, I think it's useful to just talk about the, sort of how we frame the, the thinking about the growth of the program. I think um, for many years, SSDI was heavily attacked as kind of growing out of control. And yet, other experts kind of pointed to various factors that were of a temporary nature. And even if they were temporary, they might take 10 to 20 years to, uh, to be fully realized in the program such as the increased participation of women in the labor force that, that Mark flagged earlier, that had a gradual effect on the, 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 growth, the participation in SSDI. So if you look at the data, um, as early as 2011, so right here like in the middle of the Obama administration, we began to see program applications and allowance rates dec decline. Mm -hmm. And SSDI has been essentially stable ever since that time for more than 10 years. Now, some of that was administrative actions that SSA took during the, that period in terms of tightening up the, uh, the training and the, um, and, the, and the rules around administrative law judges that was really ongoing, I think, across multiple administrations. Um, but, but the primary factors were just that these temporary aspects worked th their way through the system and the program did not um, in, fundamentally increase. The overall prevalence rates stabilized. And yet, we continue to hear a variety of policy proposals that sort of had their origin in this notion that the program was out of control, when in fact it wasn't in the past and it isn't today. So I think, anyway, keeping that in mind, there was a reference earlier to sort of economic applicants for, for SSDI versus, I think, a perception of a health-related applicant. And I think that's also kind of a fundamental misunderstanding that everyone that's being allowed is being allowed because they have a serious disabling condition and they have a, a, an extended period of not being able to do substantial gainful activity. And so there's not sort of an economic type of applicant versus a health applicant. Everybody is responding to a serious health condition and they're utilizing the social insurance nature of SSDI. I think it's really interesting to look at a piece that Manasi Despande from the University of Chicago has done and that was really very recently published in Econometrica where she calculates the, val the value of that insurance function of SSDI for wor workers that have relatively less severe conditions. Mm -hmm. These are these are workers who still qualified for SSDI, but they, quali they had not as severe of conditions as some others. And she found that the multiple insurance benefits of the program for those workers was still far in excess of the value of the cost of the program to the federal government. And she had a very rigorous quantitative method for that that I really invite that people look at. So I think this notion that we have different types of applicants, I think, is, is misleading. Um, but I think all of that is to say that there's still a lot of ways that we could improve the, the, the program. I think as Rachel alluded to, we have enormous unaccepted, unacceptable backlogs of disability applicants, and that's, um, that's, that's bad for the applicants. It's, it's really bad for people who are ultimately denied benefits, because we have a lot of research that shows that, that waiting for a decision erodes people's work functioning. So we need, need to kind of look at what's behind that increase in, in the backlogs. And clearly the pandemic has been a source of some of the problems for the agency. The tight labor market's been made, made it hard for SSA to hire. But I think we also just have to recognize that we've had sort of chronic underfunding of the Social Security Administration for years. And in the appropriations process, and I can speak to this, it's, 
having been an OMB for decades and watching this play out across multiple administrations and different types of Congresses. Um, excuse me. Um, the, the appropriations process has SSA competing with entities like National Institute of Health or um, funding for child care or funding for Head Start. And year after year, we don't see enough funds being appropriated for SSA to be able to give the level of service that beneficiaries and applicants deserve. So I think we really just have to rethink how that's being done because it really doesn't matter who's in charge in Congress, it, it, it continues. I think we also have to kind of recognize that the way SSA handles overpayments when individuals in the programs work, is that okay, almost? <laughs> um, uh, Mark had a nice chart showing the rates of work activity in the program and Chantel Boyens and I have just published a paper with Social Security Advisory Board that kind of flags the high rate of work overpayments that individuals experience. Those that are, that are doing the most to be able to work while well, in SSDI, 70% uh, of them are experiencing a work overpayment and the median overpayment is over $9,000. And so that is a weakness in the program and certainly encourage people to look at, we've put forward an alternative approach for SSA to use to address that. Um, and then I realize I'm over, I'm over time, but I do just want to flag that we need to be talking about the SSI program as much as the SSDI program. We have out-of-date asset rules in SSI. We have a, a work disincentive taking 50 cents out of every dollar that somebody in SSI is working, even when their benefits are below the poverty line. And so we're, we're not incentivizing that kind of part-time work that people can do even when they can't, aren't, aren't able to do substantial gainful activity. And we also have an in-kind support and maintenance set of, of rules that SSA has improved just in the last few months, but there's still much more work to be done. So let's talk about both SSI and SSDI. Thanks, no, thank thanks, Jack. David? Well, sure, so first of all, thanks to AEI for inviting me to to uh, participate on the panel. Um, I should say my comments are my own views and not those of any organization. Uh, Rich mentioned this uh, proposal is controversial. I think that's true. Um, and it's related to the idea that you'll likely get more denials in the system if you uh, get rid of the grids. Um, at the time this proposal is working its way through the Trump administration, there have been press, re press leaks that maybe 500,000 beneficiaries might miss out on benefits or be denied under this proposal. And I don't, it was never clear what the real number was, but you know, we've got 14 or 15 million people in the rolls, even if this leads to a small percentage of that uh, group getting denied instead of awarded, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of uh, people might be denied benefits. So in my remarks, I wanna provide some context about who's on the rolls. I think that's gonna clarify a lot of this discussion. Um, I'm gonna talk about SSA's experience in trying to get people uh, back to work. And then I wanna make a couple of comments uh, about the occupational requirements survey. So Mark's proposal is focused on step five of the determination process, and not all applications make it to step five. Uh, but if they do, the disability determination is guided by uh, uh, what are informally called the grid rules. Now, it's important to note the law requires SSA to take age into account. It's not something that SSA created out of whole cloth. Um, and so following congressional intent, an older person with a severe impairment, impairment is more likely uh, to receive disability than a younger person with a severe impairment. So Mark raises this as an important point in terms of equity concerns, but I do want to emphasize or make clear that uh, Mark's proposal doesn't necessarily help younger applicants, such as the sympathetic 32-year-old veteran with a brain injury. Um, it just means that it will be more likely that an older applicant will be denied. But backing up a little bit, um, we know something about DI applicants at step five. Uh, this is not that surprising. We know they've made it through step four. And so at step four, uh, Social Security is trying to determine whether the person can do their past work. So for example, if the person was a cashier, SSA is trying to determine does their impairment prevent them from being a cashier, as they've described it, or as how it's generally performed in the economy. So we know those who make it to step five have some problems, health problems that interfere with work at some level. And because of that, on the face of it, we would expect their work capacity to be somewhat limited. And so I want to talk some about some descriptive statistics from a survey called the Survey of Income and Program Participation. Um, it was in a paper I published in the Journal of Disability Policy Studies, but I think it frames the issue well. Um, one of the, when you look at sort of who's on the rolls and what their circumstances are, 
what you see is there's a high prevalence of serious health problems. And this is uh, Jack's point, are there, there are economic applicants? Well, that might affect things, but fundamentally people who are trying to get on social security dis disability roles have very serious health problems. So based on the SIP data, the Survey of Income and Program Participation data, in a given year, you'd expect about 27% of DI beneficiaries to be hospitalized. Doctor visits are very common. The majority of DI beneficiaries have six or more doctor visits. Two-thirds of the DI beneficiaries report difficulty doing something simple, such as standing for an hour. About 46% report, report being frequently depressed or anxious. The statistics for the general working age population are radically different. Uh, in a given year, hospitalizations and extensive doctor visits are rare. Uh, only 5% of the general working age population reports difficulty standing for an hour, and only 6% report being frequently depressed or anxious. Interesting, the health profile of denied applicants is somewhat similar to approved applicants, and by extension, uh, radically worse than the general population. So it's not just the health problems, but the DI and SSI populations are very different than the general population in terms of their demographic and economic circumstances. So for example, 20 to 30 percent of DI and SSI recipients have not finished high school, which is roughly two to three times the percentage for the general working age population. Poverty and material hardship among DI and SSI populations are much higher than they are for the general population. Deny DI applicants, which is a major issue given that this proposal might lead to more denials, uh, face particularly bleak situations. 38% uh, 30, of the denied applicants live in poverty. 43% face material hardship, meaning they can't cover food, utility, or housing costs. In addition, nearly 26% of African, nearly 20%, of denied applicants are African American. So Mark's proposal, I think, would lead to more denials in the Social Security program. And given the health and economic profile of the night applicants, it's likely, in my view, that what one of the main outcomes of that will be just increased hardship among the medically and economically vulnerable population. I do want to mention a couple of uh, things about SSA has been in the space for a long time. And so, for example, they've run many uh, gold standard random assignment demonstrations to see if there was some way to get individuals on the DI roles back into the workforce. Um, these uh, random assignment demonstrations are as close as the social sciences can get to what's done in the physical uh, sciences. None of SSA's demonstrations that have altered financial incentives to work or provided employment support have found an ability to increase the earnings of DI and SSI recipients by a large amount. Why is that? My view is because health problems are the dominant issue here. I want to mention a couple of other things. It's not just the technical work of these demonstrations. In studying the, the process of these demonstrations, a lot of qualitative information was found. So for example, in SSA's mental health treatment study, SSA contracted with mental health uh, centers around the country to provide um, case management, additional health benefits, aggressive employment support uh, to individuals on the DI roles. The centers of those uh, mental health centers would often very frequently report back to SSA the people you're sending us to, to try to find work for, to give better services, they have very serious health problems, not just mental, but physical health problems. It is very hard to get uh, people with their circumstances um, back in the workforce and earning a, a high level. SSA's most recent demonstration is the supported employment demonstration, and that actually is looking at denied applicants. But again, when you talk to the uh, healthcare providers that are providing services in this demonstration, the nurse care coordinators, qualitatively what they say are, uh, this population has serious mental and physical health problems. It's very hard to place them in work. So that kind of rings true to me in the sense that these are people who see sick people every day. They run community health centers. Uh, they know who has health problems and who doesn't. And when SSA sends them people to try to get them uh, working again, their comment is these people have very serious health problems. So I want to talk a, um, a little bit also about uh, an issue that came up a little bit. Um, in the DI program, there are no real disincentives to work part-time. Uh, you can earn up to $1,500 and still not be above the substantial gainful activity level. Despite that, 85% of DI um, beneficiaries don't work at all. So what's going on there? There's no reason they can't work some. We know they have low economic status. It would better their economic status. 
So what's going on there? I think, again, the health problems or the health impairments in this population are so severe um, that even uh, limited work is extremely difficult. So I want to make a couple of observations about the Occupational Requirements Survey um, that Mark talked about in his proposal. Um, Jack alluded to this. The data from the um, Occupational Requirements Survey can be used to replace the Dictionary of Occupational Titles, or DOT, without changing the good rules in the way that uh, Mark proposes. I see the DOT replacement as more of a technical exercise. I think Mark's proposal, and he might agree, is, is really more of a policy exercise. But the ORS, or the Occupational Requirements Survey, does tell us something about the modern economy. So using that data, BLS estimates 29% of the jobs in the economy are sedentary. That means 71% are not. In addition, sedentary work is typically skilled work and vice versa. So for example, BLS reports that offices and administrative support occupations, such as customer service representatives, administrative assistants, data entry workers, those jobs are typically sedentary, but they're generally not unskilled occupations, at least the way SSA defines it. And some occupations, such as food preparation occupations, such as cooks, bartenders, dishwashers, waiters, uh, those generally are unskilled as, as SSA defines it, but they're almost never sedentary. So in an economy as large as the one the U.S. has, easy jobs, meaning unskilled and sedentary, uh, do exist, uh, but they're not close to being the norm, and thus transitions to new types of work, uh, which is the focus of step five, uh, will not obviously be easy for older individuals. So I tend to agree with Rich that I think the proposal is controversial. I think policymakers will view uh, this proposal with some skepticism because they'll think that uh, 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 work capacity of the DI and SSI eligible population is not high. Uh, there'll be a lot of concern about getting additional denials in the program, particularly for a population that has low economic status. And I think the other issue will be there's going to be some sensitivity around uh, any changes to Social Security. So to get more denials in the system, that's a reduction in Social Security benefits being paid out. And I think that'll be um, especially um, an issue because currently uh, the DI program is solvent. Uh, the latest results from uh, the actuaries are that the system is solvent over the next 75 years. So I think there are probably proposals, and Jack alluded this a little bit, where you might get some policy consensus on uh, policymakers do value work and getting people back to work. There may be proposals that could reach uh, policy consensus. Um, I don't think this particular one will, but that doesn't mean that work isn't important and that uh, policymakers can't continue to look at that aspect of policy. Um, uh, with that said, so I think work capacity among DI and SSI uh, beneficiaries or eligible individuals is pretty limited. I do acknowledge some studies show, uh, conclude that disabled individuals could work or have increased earnings. Uh, one thing to note, just on a data, on a data level, is that uh, the final report of this, uh, supported employment demonstration will be released by SSA in the next two months. That is directly on point to the policy issues here, because it's trying to test whether if you aggressively give services to denied applicants, can they work and can they have substantial earnings. Great, David. So we want to um, leave a few minutes for questions. Um, but before we do that, I do want to just Hammer um, one point about holding the Social Security Administration accountable, because I think you guys all agree um, on one thing, which is, okay, there's an ideological difference on what updating and modernizing the, you know, the data that, that the agency takes into account when determining if someone is eligible for benefits. I think, you know, conservatives um, feel that a modern, you know, list of jobs um, would you know would would deny more people benefits, um, and that's you know more their goal to tighten the program. You know, liberals and advocates for the disabled um, are are convinced that a modern list of occupations, you know, where there are more sedentary computer jobs, let's say, but as David, you just said, they're more unskilled jobs. I mean, sorry, they're more skilled jobs. Would would make it actually harder for people to work and that more people would get benefits. But just let's take a step back here and, and realize that the, social, the gov taxpayers have paid 
you know, $300 million for, for a system that is not in use. And I did a big story on this in December, and when I asked the Social Security Administration why, they had no answer. I asked them, you know, why is this modern system sitting there and no, you, we have paid, the taxpayers have paid this money to the Labor Department to, to come up with it. They had no answer. They, they just wrote me in an email and said, um, you know, we're still using the old system, period. So I, I think um, it, it is really something to take into account that, you know, the policy may be controversial and too controversial to change, but the agency really, I think, needs to take responsibility for all the money it spent. Um, uh, anyway, that's my view. But um, I am, um, so anyway. Can I just make one comment on, on sure. that? Sure. It is important to understand that SSA does need to issue a regulation yes. to do this. Yes, but they're and, not doing that. And before that's done, the agency doesn't tend to discuss in public what it's thinking about. I mean, it. It's a pre-decisional process between the SSA right. and the White House. Yeah, but sure. Jack is, is not even on the agenda. But that doesn't mean that work isn't going on. So, I mean, I think it's yeah. just, it's, uh. I mean, it, we've, we've had a change in leadership, and I think we need to give the new leadership a chance to... It's been, um, it's been two years. Yeah. But well, also, the number of days that it takes for the initial application has more than doubled since 2019, and fewer people are applying. So it should be the opposite. If fewer people applying, you should be able to get those done quicker. And so we're yeah. just not seeing the accountability yeah. of. Jack, you may be right. I think the problem with an acting leader, which is what we have now at the agency and what I think is likely to continue through the end of the Biden administration, you know, acting leaders tend to be, um, mm -hmm. you know, more risk averse and not want to move toward implementing um, policies that will certainly rough make people on both sides of the ideological aisle um, unhappy, you know? So the status quo seems to be more um, the mode of, of operation of an acting leader. Uh, it's just my experience in writing about government. Um, but you may be right. There may be lots of things happening. Um, sir, there. Yeah, so I'll make a couple comments. Uh, here, I, I'm not sure I agree with um, everybody, but I, I think your point that SSA needs to uh, start using the data is, is true. And the agency's been slow to do that. Um, when we started working on uh, building the Occupational Requirement Survey uh, back in 2011 or 2012, working with BLS, the issue was old even then. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. um, I do feel like um, this is something that is um, technical. Um, it's perfectly fine to hold the agency accountable if they don't make progress, yeah. in my view. Yeah. Well, anyway. Um, Please, uh, any thoughts, any questions for any of the panelists? Great. We can hear I you, think I think. You can probably hear me, but <laughs> I've got a lot of projection. Um, I have a couple of things I want to bring up. First of all, what interaction with stakeholders has, has there been, people who are actually have disabilities who are trying to work? Because I can tell you from having gone from work to being on benefits to sitting off benefits and going back to work, it's awful, and it's subjective depending on who you've got sitting in front of you on the other side of the desk. And what interaction has there been with people with disabilities in their process through that? And what plans are in place with this to hold the agency accountable so that everybody judges by the same standard and not this, I, this very subjective case in point? Um, I was very sick in 2008 when we moved from New York City to D.C., so my husband says, right before, when you move, you have to go into that Social Security office and tell them you've moved. And, and the person behind the desk looked at me and she said, I told her I was looking for work, that I was feeling better, and I was trying to go back to work. She says, why would you want to do that when the government will take care of you? Um, I had to remember that I don't look good in orange and that I don't look good in stripes before I went across the desk at her. Because it was, <laughs> her attitude was disincentivizing to work if I were somebody that wanted to be taken care of. So bureaucrats should not be allowed to say things like that to people that they're supposed to be able to, be able to that they're supposed to be in place to help. So I, um, I just would like to know what your um, process for those two things is. And then the third thing is with employers, um, I can tell you that there are 61 million people with disabilities in this country. 
ha um, three quarters of them are either underemployed or unemployed, and they have massive skills. The pandemic showed us that they're an untapped labor market. That said, people are afraid to hire people with disabilities, and I think it's incumbent on all of us sitting here, and I'm sorry, I'm Melissa Ortiz. I work for um, the National Center for Public Policy Research, and I'm their senior advisor for Able Americans, which is um, a free market approach to disabilities. And so that's why another reason why this is so important to me. So can you, those three things, can you kind of tell me where we are on those? I'll, I'll take uh, at least part of, part of your question. <laughs> you, you raise uh, many, many good points. I think really the, the current system is subject to this uh, arbitrariness and this uh, discretion because you know, the grid, which was intended to be very scientific and very specific, you know, doesn't, doesn't apply. Uh, you're, you're off the grid, you're in this framework, and you know, the agency hires vocational experts, and then the judge or the uh, adjudicator at the DDS level, um, you know, makes a judgment, and it, it, it's, the research is, is very clear. There's a lot, of, a lot of arbitrariness in it. So therefore, I think relying either exclusively or, you know, 90% on just data to be objective is really the goal. And I think it has another advantage, which I think uh, the, the panel has, has, has uh, mentioned. If you, if you can sort of even computerize the whole thing, the judgment, um, it's gonna go much faster. Because the, the whole deal with adjudicators and judges and so on, you know, it's, it's a very cumbersome, long, long process. And so therefore, if the process can be made more objective, more data-oriented, It'll go faster, it'll be, it won't be as arbitrary. And that certainly was a motivation that we had, that I had in, in, in this proposal. Uh, I, I'll speak for Andrew Saul, um, who was the commissioner, who, who was fired for President Biden. Um, you know, his motivation for supporting this was exactly, it wasn't on so much on the policy, but it was on, on the administration of the program that he just, there's a lot of resources that go into, you know, there, there are 15, Hundred ALJs, there are literally thousands of adjudicators. If you know the process can be can be more automated, more made more data dependent, it'll just go faster and it'll be uh, a benefit to the public and to you, you know, as a disabled person as well as to the agency. So I'm just about to say there's a dichotomy you said between the conservatives and the progressives and whatever on this. I guess I'm a conservative. Uh, <laughs> But the point is that this is a more objective way to do it, and we're removing an old notion of age that was used because we didn't have that kind of information for this better data. And I don't know for a fact how it's gonna turn out, but I think we need to find out how it's gonna turn out, and that's better than doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And right now, the is Anyone else? You speak of the old, uh, J.P. Hogan, I write about politics. Uh, you speak of the old programs and the new programs in between. America got Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act. So I'm wondering where your definitions have to pair to that if you change, um, and whether there's room for state-based solutions. If you have to change these terms, if you solve these issues closer to a community and people stay a part of community, is that logic allowed to still be present? Do you have to change this at the national level, or is there ways to work the new language as a state-by-state -state solution? Um, well, I mean, it is a federal program. Both DI is certainly, you know, is, it's a trust fund. It's, it's a federal program. SSI is also, um, is, you know, financed on a, on, on a it is a, a administered, I should say, on a, on a federal basis. It's using the same definitions of eligibility as is uh, used in SSI or used in DI. Um, but with that being said, I think there's nothing that prevents some of these innovative ideas being done on a, on a state basis. Uh, absolutely. But, but I think where that's happened in the broader Social Security program has been non-covered state and local employees. And because of long histories with the program when it was established in the 1930s, initially state and local employees weren't covered. And a certain number of them have joined the program, but many haven't. And we just see constant administrative problems when you have 
some covered workers and some not covered workers and people transitioning across different jobs and making sure that those workers are treated fairly and understand the benefits they're going to get when they retire. This is more of a retirement problem than a, a DI problem, but it just, I think it makes me skeptical. I would rather go to 100% federal than try to permit experimentation at the state level because the state and local worker example has been so problematic for the agency and for the, and for the workers themselves. So, so let, let me give the opposite argument uh, and do it in the context of, Jack, what you said, that we haven't talked about SSI. SSI basically is a guaranteed uh, benefit for people with disabilities. But the real failure of DI and SSI from the, OS, from the Social Security system is there's no first attempt at accommodation, rehabilitation, uh, job coaching before you come on to the program. The states have tremendous experience in this through TANF. And one could devolve, the, if you're going to think big, devolve the SSI to the states, pay them in the same way that you did for TANF, and let the states go at it, and how they would get people off the rolls, or when they were coming on to the rolls, uh, provide the kind of vocational rehabilitation and other things that are at the state level. That is a really revolutionary idea. So I'm sure that the progressives will be really shocked at that. But that is what other countries are doing. They have a unified vocational rehabilitation and benefit program in one agency. And you have this. The real problem is many of the things that you're arguing about, Jack, I agree with. Once you're on the rolls, you're very unlikely to get off the rolls. But why wasn't vocational rehabilitation, we, you, you talked about this at the start, why wasn't vocational rehabilitation and uh, work training and other kinds of things from the, from the VR, part of the process that you had to show that this didn't help you before you get onto this program that's gonna uh, give, you, give you money. That's, that's how other countries handle this. We're unique in that way. If anything, we're disincentivizing because we're saying prove for at least five months that you can't do anything. So why would you wanna go and try if that just puts your waiting period that much further? There is a program that you guys know much more about than I do called <laughs> is, is I think Social Security's attempt to um, you know, sort of do what you're saying, uh, Rich, and trying to work, you know, so work the vocation, uh, rehabil work, work into the benefit, but it, it is a very un under- I was uh, appointed by Senator Monaghan to be on the original Ticket to Work program. I had great expectations for this, as did many of us who were pushing the sort of ideas that I'm having. And there's just a report that came out in the Social Security Bulletin last week, which you should look at if you haven't seen it, that shows that, yes, in a very narrow sense, Ticket to Work works, but it works for almost nobody. And that you, the, the only people who actually uh, have large gains from it are people who are just on the rolls. But just think how much better it would be if, this, if Social Security could do that for two years before people came onto the rolls, so the flow coming into the system was less. That's where the real action is, and by law, the Social Security can't do that. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree that the ticket to work has problems and very low take up, and I think we could probably spend a whole session on it. Um, I mean, I, I would just go and encourage people to look at the paper we published for the Social Security Advisory Board on work related overpayments, because that is sort of the normal process SSA uses to adjust people's benefits when they do try to work. And that process doesn't work well for beneficiaries. And um, I think that I would encourage people to put their energy there as opposed to the ticket to work because that's what the universe, I mean, that's what the vast majority of beneficiaries who are trying to work are being affected by and oftentimes disincentive, I mean, discouraged from continuing to try because of the way it's administered. Yeah. I know we have to stop again. Yeah, so I'll mention a, a couple things. One is, um, I think this idea of early intervention um, has a lot of traction, and some of the demonstrations that SSA is currently uh, running, I mean, I mentioned the supported employment demonstration, is trying to reach people uh, with services before they get on the roll. So we'll see what I needs come from that. Uh, the ticket to work, uh, as uh, Jack alluded to, it's overlaid on top of a complex system, so it's, um, it's hard to um, communicate to beneficiaries um, about what's going on in the program. One thing, I, I don't think there'll be general agreement on this, but I, I've, I've often wondered whether, uh, for those who are on the rolls, maybe there should be some acknowledgement that 
they face such serious health impairments, I don't think all the activities around increasing work should be geared towards getting them off the rolls. Mm -hmm. I do wonder if there should be some support in helping them work part-time or have some earnings. And the Ticket to Work program, almost by law and the way it's administered, is focused exclusively on getting people off the rolls. So there's always this focus on, can you get them to exit the rolls? Whereas I think maybe a more uh, humane, realistic, effective approach might be uh, to have programs that uh, try to support at least uh, some work mm -hmm. among DI beneficiaries. Yeah, right. I can just make one point getting back to the, the topic of I think it's mostly on the disability determination side and that's what Mars proposal is looking at. Um, when you look at who is on the rolls, yes, there are some people that really don't have much work capacity, but there are some that do and that's because of the determination process. And I wish I had a graph to put up here. If you track the unemployment rate and the disability insurance rolls, they go right with each other until the COVID-19 recession, which was of course induced, and that was because you had easily accessible and very generous unemployment benefits, and then even once those ended, we have a really strong job market where wages are rising and there's more opportunities for people. So we haven't seen that uptick this time. If you just wouldn't see that trend if everybody was truly having the same level of lack of ability to work. And so I think that you serve the program better and you can actually tailor it better if you know that everybody is on, that is on there has a pretty reduced capacity to work. But the problem is now is that you're dealing with a really wide range and some people do have pretty significant capacity where others don't. Huh. So, okay. What? We gotta stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we didn't get to the people who, who wrote in. All right, I'm sorry. There were two <laughs> questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them, but anyway, thanks everyone. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.